Merck is holding uh, its investor day in New York today. Meg Terrell joins us now with a special guest. Hi, Meg. Hi, Joe. And that special guest is Merck CEO Ken Frazier. Ken, thanks for having us here. It's great to be here this morning. So first investor day you've held in five years. Uh, people are going to be looking to you for answers about where your future growth is coming from. And of course, your big drug, Keytruda, and cancer has just been a juggernaut for you. But a lot of questions people have is, where do you go outside of Keytruda for growth? So Keytruda, of course, is an unprecedented drug in terms of its scope of activity. But what we're here to show today is that we have great opportunities to grow revenue beyond Keytruda with our vaccines, our animal health business, our hospital and specialty business, the oncology pipeline beyond Keytruda. So we have those opportunities to drive revenue growth, margin expansion. We're also here to remind people that we have the balance sheet strength to do whatever deals we need to do to augment our pipeline. But most importantly today is to show off the great bench of talent that we have in this company. Well, in terms of M&A, there was a story in the journal yesterday suggesting that you're looking for more sort of small bolt-on acquisitions along the size of things we've seen you do already, around a billion dollars or less. What can we expect from you in terms of future M&A? We think the, the thing for us to do is to focus on the best external science and to also look for value-creating deals. And so for us, the sweet spot has always been more on the early side, where our in-house biological and scientific expertise can be brought to bear to create that kind of value. What therapeutic areas are you most interested in? Obviously, you've got a huge presence in cancer, um, but what else are you looking at? But that's the point. We're therapeutic agnostic. Mm -hmm. If you went back six years, Merck would not have been a cancer company at all. Mm -hmm. So we think it's a mistake to, tr to try to decide up front what are the right therapeutic categories. We try to let the science lead us. Mm -hmm. Uh, you also have a focus on antibiotics when a lot of companies have left the space. Is that a good business for you to be in, for anyone to be in, considering so few companies are still in it? Well, it's an important thing for public health. You know, 700,000 people in this country will be exposed to a resistant form of bacteria this year. Uh, in 2050, people say 10 million people around the world will die from antimicrobial resistance. So the society needs us to stay in that space. I think what's important is that we have to have different market incentives so that more companies will join this space. Because right now, it's not a good business proposition, but it's an important public health proposition. Do you think you can find a way to make that market work, to make these drugs profitable for markets? Well, we try to work with policymakers to ensure that they understand the need to, for example, decouple the reimbursement from the volume. If you discover these kinds of new antibiotics, in some cases, they want to be held in reserve for people who fail the ones that have been overused. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing Leon Cooperman has a question for you. Sure. I'm curious to help me out in my portfolio. It's one of the weak areas this year in the market has been healthcare-related companies. What do you think the chances are of a Medicare for all uh, passing? Uh, can the country afford it? Does it uh, make sense? And uh, then, of course, the president's dialogue regarding drug prices. Where do you come out on that? Well, first of all, thank you for the question, Mr. Cooperman. Uh, I have to say that I think with respect to Medicare for all, the thing that I worry about is that innovation largely comes from the private market. Medicare has an important role to play. But I think, uh, to your point, it will be hard for us to afford uh, the Medicare for all as it's now being posited. As it relates to drug pricing, uh, we want to work with the president. Uh, we want to work with people on both sides of the aisle. It's really important for patients to be able to afford medicines. I think the biggest problem right now for patients is the out-of-pocket expense, which is largely driven by the fact that while we pay significant rebates to insurers and PBMs, those don't get passed on to the customer at the pharmacy counter. My doctor friends tell me the best way to deal with the problem is to raise copays because they see a lot of people coming to see them that really shouldn't be coming to see them because they have nothing to do, the senior citizens, and so they want some, some place to go, some activity. And if you raise the co-pays, they'll cut the visits by quite a bit. Well, ironically, co-pays are actually larger for drugs than they are for the rest of medical treatment. For the average person, they're 3% for doctor visits, but they're 13% of the list price for drugs. So it actually discourages people from filling prescriptions. And because they don't fill prescriptions, they present later with bigger health problems. Interesting. Well, I so congratulate you. You've done a great job for the company. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thinking about Medicare for all and these sort of political questions, uh, we've got the first Democratic debates coming up next week. Um, drug pricing has been a huge topic from both sides of the aisle. Your industry just getting hammered. Um, what are you expecting from the 2020 election season in that front? 
Well, I don't think I have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what the outcome will be, but I can tell you where Merck's position will be. We have always tried to take policy positions that are supportive of what patients need, and we're going to work with people on both sides of the aisle, no matter what our democracy produces in this next election cycle. Okay. And you've been CEO since 2011. Uh, there are some questions about succession planning. Um, what is your plan? What can you tell us about who might be taking over after you? My plan is to continue to focus on Merck's ability to bring cutting-edge science to bear, translate it into things that make a difference for patients, and my entire team is completely focused on that. Well, Bloomberg reported yesterday you're looking uh, primarily at internal candidates. Is that right? Well, I can say that our board has a process. This is not my decision. It's the board's decision. And I think the good thing is that we have a deep bench of internal talent that can fill not only my position, but all the important positions in Merck. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that's come up for Merck recently, there was a story in the Washington Post just a few days ago, uh, is about a small drug in your portfolio uh, for bladder cancer called BCG. Mm -hmm. Old drug, Merck has been left as the only supplier of that drug after Sanofi dropped out of the market a few years ago, and there's a shortage. You told me a couple weeks ago you wouldn't raise the price because it wouldn't be the responsible thing to do. But by raising the price, could you then manufacture more of that? Could you supply the whole market if, if you did raise the price? I think this is an exemplar of a big problem that's going to continue to be here for us going forward. When the prices of drugs get too low, particularly drugs that are generic drugs, then you don't have a market incentive for people to put the capital up to build facilities like we need for additional amounts of this BCG drug. So for Merck, the challenge is how can we maximize the amount that we can make for patients, given the fact that the other two companies have now dropped out of the market. But the moral of the story is sometimes drugs are not available because the prices are too low, mm -hmm. not because the prices are too high. All right, an interesting conundrum. Ken Frazier, thanks for having us here. It's always a pleasure.